Okay, <laughs> hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for turning out tonight. I know you're all busy and tired, and even the lure of a free glass of wine from the IDM wouldn't normally be enough to get you out. So thank you very much for turning up. We only have an hour, and I'm going to be as succinct and to the point as I can be. And we're talking about something which I think is really interesting. It's the changing role of marketing. And I'd be feeling lively and fully charged and ready to go. And uh, my job is to keep it like that for one hour. And then there might be another glass of IDM wine. This is based on a blog post that I wrote for the IDM a little while ago, reclaiming the other three Ps. And as I'm going to say in a minute, we have four Ps in marketing. And some of us spend a lot of time working on only one of them, which is the fourth one, marketing communications, otherwise known as P for promotion. And what about the other three? We sometimes forget them. And also, this is very much the theme of my new book, published by Routledge and Taylor and Francis, written with two Dutch co-authors. And we have Sophia, welcome from Taylor and Francis Routledge with us tonight, who's giving us a special discount for IDM members. So look out for that at the end. And that's all I'm allowed to say about the book. <clears throat> May already have said too much. Okay, so here it is. Product, price, place, promotion. It's like one of those old marketing chestnuts, isn't it? One of those cliches. And without telling you exactly how old I am, there is one other person in this room who was on the diploma with me who looks much, much younger. And I won't tell, her who she, tell you who she is, but that narrows it down. She may be blushing now. Uh, but we studied it. We studied it, and it hasn't changed. And there's quite a lot of stuff that I studied at the when I did the IDM diploma, which was then called the BDMA diploma. Funny how it kind of goes in circles. Now here we are in DMA house, and that it's still true. And nowadays I teach a lot of marketing, and I teach undergraduates and postgraduates. It's true, so you teach it, you know, the four P's of marketing and SWOT analysis and Pastel and Porter's Five Forces. They're still in books, I promise you, and they're evergreen. And however, the, book, the big point is what I'm saying about the other three P's, which marketing seems to have kind of surrendered to some of our colleagues. And actually, they need us because we're the customer people. We know customers better than anyone else in the organization. And my argument is we should stand up and reclaim them, okay? So without getting too militant, also the audience isn't necessarily here. We need the CEOs who are giving all the, the other Ps to our colleagues in the C-suite. But we've got to start with galvanizing ourselves before we can go out and convert the rest of the world. So maybe it's true that we're largely restricted to the last P, which is not even so much a P as an MC. The other one that's a bit of a cheat is D, P for distribution. That would be place. So it was never really four Ps, let's face it. Uh, on the other hand, we have definitely given away some of them. So if we've surrendered control of product, price, and place, who's got them? I would say it was finance. We love finance. Is finance here? Don't admit. Sales. The distribution department. There are people that actually make sure the product is in the right place at the right time. Very, very important. But they're not normally the marketing people, are they? and of course, manufacturing operations. And as we know, in the last few years, digital has changed a lot of stuff. Digital has complicated what we thought was under control and thrown lots of challenges into the paths of CEOs and the rest of the board because it's disruption. You know, it's a cliche, isn't it, digital disruption? But we're all facing that. And in this world, with increasing pressure on resources, the poor senior marketers including some of you, I'm sure, feel a bit beleaguered and short of people and under a lot of pressure and maybe not even appreciated. But if people just want you to do marketing communications and that's all you have the resources to do, it's a bit difficult to say, well, we want these other three Ps as well. And I do understand that. On the other hand, if you're the CEO, you should be listening to the people who understand the customers and that is marketers. So, as champions of the customer within the organization, shouldn't we be closely involved with the other three Ps? That is product, price, and place. So my whole thing this evening is arguing for a holistic role for marketing in the digital age, of course, including offline and online. When I did that diploma, there was no online. And I say that to my students, and they just can't imagine a world 
<clears throat> some of you are probably young enough to be in that category. A world without email. You know, it's, for some of my students, email is already dead. But a world without social media, a world when you didn't have a website to look everything up on. And yeah, but on the other hand, the offline stuff hasn't died, at least not yet. So as marketers, we should be holistic, of course. Even marketing communications is pretty fragmented, but we certainly should be looking at offline and online. Modern marketers should be owning the marketing strategy, be the experts at using the web, for instance, for market research, for product development, and also fulfillment and order of processing. And we're best placed to advise the business on e-commerce, if there is e-commerce in your business, and of course, online pricing. So in this evening's very brief talk, I'm gonna try and look at some of the issues around pricing and distribution. And of course, the internet is disrupting product price and place, and also, of course, promotion. And going back to the other cliche of SWOT, we've got both opportunities and always threats. And for the companies that take advantage of all these opportunities, I think there is a chance for a real competitive advantage. But marketers shouldn't be marginalized to just being the coloring in department. Marketers need to plan and execute effective marketing across the entire mix and all four Ps. Okay, so we have no need to spend any time on this. Bringing buyers and sellers together, meeting customer needs profitably. I won't quote any other marketing organization's definition of marketing, but we know what it is, you know. And of course, the famous four Ps always comes up in any definition of marketing, the so-called marketing mix. Coined as a phrase in 1960 by Mr. E. Jerome McCarthy and kind of popularized by Professor Philip Kotler, who is, of course, the greatest living marketing guru. Seth Godin's running him close, I think. Bringing buyers and sellers together profitably, satisfying customers' wants and needs at a profit, particularly in B2B. And, you know, I've, I've worked in companies like Procter & Gamble, which are, of course, B2C. But for a while, they sent me out into the field, and that was selling to wholesalers, cash and carries, and you were, in fact, selling B2B in order for them to sell to their customers. And in that case, there were times when I went in to present the new aerial detergent, and the guy said, well, how much are you spending on TV? I suppose I've got to take it. Things haven't changed that much. You know, there's still this feeling that marketing can help sales, help you get your foot in the door, put the buyer into a mood where they are responsive and susceptible to whatever the sales guy wants to explain. So marketing is a management process, giving customers what they want, but not, of course, at any price, identifying, anticipating requirements, fulfilling them profitably. And this is a Kotlerism, an exchange of ideas, goods, and services. And of course, he doesn't just mean you give someone a product and they give you money. He's talking about exchange of other stuff like your time, like your attention. So why should people look at your website? Well, they call it content marketing, don't they? Maybe it's just content. I also question how new this is. We've always needed content. You know, running a newspaper in the 20th century. Remember the 20th century? You needed content for the front page. Give me an exclusive. Give me a story. You can't bore people into buying, David Ogilvy once said. So yeah, we've always needed content. And that's what marketing has always been about. And this wonderful cliche, which I think I copied from someone, but I can't remember whom, so no Harvard referencing. What's in it for me? With them. You can use that one. Okay, and still quoting the greats of marketing, it's probably Peter Drucker this time. Profitable exchange, a mutually acceptable bargain, a market focus, meeting people's perceived wants and needs. And that's an interesting old one, isn't it? The difference between a want and a need. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, we don't need much, do we? water, food, shelter, freedom from fear, then we're starting to get a bit greedy, like uh, respect, love, partners, etc. And finally, you're self-fulfilled and you're David Beckham and everyone loves you. You know, the idea of attaining everything you can in this world. But you could say that marketing is helping people up that hierarchy from what they be just being comfortable, being okay, to aspiration. And that's where perhaps a need is replaced by a want. And a pan company ethos of customer orientation. And if I ever invent this, it would be called Berry's Four Rights. The right message to the right individual via the right channel at the right time. And when I present to Americans, I explain this is my British humor, H-U-M-O-R. In other words, 
of course it's not easy. Some of you do this stuff every single day, and it's very hard, isn't it? The right message? How do you even know that? You know, how can you engage customers without boring them? What is the right channel? Well, that seems to change. Maybe they're getting a bit too old for Facebook. We need to sw switch to Instagram. Is Snapchat really ever going to make it? What about Pinterest? Foursquare's already dead. It's hard work, isn't it? And you know, media is, is always a challenge. The right individual is what the IDM used to talk about when they were in direct marketing. And it's always been right, hasn't it? Why talk to everyone when you can talk to someone, said some old direct marketing guru. But that's extremely difficult. There will be some wastage. There's wastage in social media, massive wastage. There's still a lot of wastage on TV. And ideally, we are targeting the message only to the people who are interested. And it's what Seth Godin calls permission marketing. On that basis, it's not intrusive and boring and irrelevant and even annoying. It's actually welcome. Thank you. That's useful. Oh, you've got that book. Okay, I'll buy that one. At the right time. None of them are easy. And here's one of my own heroes who's a bit of a bad boy of advertising. I mean, probably done some things that no one can applaud. But he's Charles Saatchi, who's half of Saatchi and Saatchi, the other Saatchi, who was Morris and a famous curmudgeon and seems to get more grumpy as he gets older. But he says some great things. Great advertising is when an idea captures the imagination of the public and makes them change the way they think, feel, or behave. Yes, that's it. And I think we can take advertising in its most general sense. Or maybe you can call it a P, great marketing communications. And this is another guru and great success in our business. It's Ashley Friedline who founded e-consultancy and sold it to Centaur a few blocks away from here very successfully. Let us not underestimate the value of tactics. There's a lot of talk about strategy. Strategy seems to be somehow grander and more high level and high brow. But he's talking about tactics. Tactics are about execution. Sun Tzu supposedly said strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory, but tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. It's a good one, isn't it? We need the right marketing strategy to win, but we may, may well need digital marketing to get us to victory quicker. And someone from his organization said to me seven years ago, I think digital's got about another five years. Yeah. I'm not going to name that director but actually sold it before we got to the current time. Maybe even we're in post-digital marketing, but that would be another talk for another night. Okay, and I love this version of Alice in Wonderland <clears throat> with Helena Bonham Carter. What a great quote. It takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place, said the queen, the red queen. Does it ever feel like that at work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not to mix too many metaphors, it's spinning plates and keeping all the cards in the air, you know? And uh, meanwhile, the boss is screaming at you and the CEO is saying, we need more and you're getting less to do it with. Yeah, I sort of understand. I think the next bit of this quote is, to get anywhere else, you have to run at least twice as fast. <clears throat> Good luck. Um, we are living without too much cliche in very interesting times. Stuff is changing. The customer is changing. And the technology keeps on moving at a fast rate. There is no sign of it slowing down, is there? Okay, let's all just keep a phone like this now for 10 years. Think that's going to happen? I don't think so. I think we'll soon be wearing the phone, and maybe not in 10 years, it will be implanted in us. Yuck. I said that to some students, and they say, yeah, sure. We have chips implanted in our arms to get into clubs. Okay, so the older you are, the more you say yuck. <clears throat> anyway, we're not doing that, that talk tonight either. What about this? Alexa, manage my brand preferences. Does anyone have experience of these artificial intelligences, virtual assistants? Who is your favorite? You won't let them in? No, it's not a certain Are you sure? It will be in your next TV. <laughs> Alexa may sneak in in some device. So those who don't hate the whole idea of it, um, Cortana, Siri, Bixby from Samsung, give up on that one, really. I'm just trying to kill Bixby off my phone at the moment, but yeah. she's very persistent, or is it a, is it a he? Yeah. Anyway, uh, Alexa isn't listening to you unless you say the wake word. Believe that? <clears throat> Alexa, buy me some coffee. Alexa, we're out of toilet paper. I know that. I've already reordered it for you. Okay. 
So if we don't have a preference for what instant coffee we drink, maybe we should leave it to Alexa. Alexa, just make sure you top up the coffee every week, okay, from Amazon Prime. Okay, so then Alexa is making brand decisions. So who does Nestle have to sell to? Well, there are about five customers, aren't there? There's Siri, Cortana. Hmm, interesting. The future of FMCG, <clears throat> five customers. Okay, back to tonight, the marketing mix. The set of marketing tools that the firm uses to pursue its marketing objectives. Four broad levels, we've talked about them. Marketing theory emerged in the early 20th century. <laughs> I had a student say to me recently, Mike, you were in marketing in the early 1990s. Uh, yes, yes, and possibly before, but I'm not telling you that. Uh, that was before digital. Yes. So did you not teach digital marketing then? No, because there wasn't any. <laughs> and her eyes went so big and round, and she just couldn't quite get her head around that. Not only was there no digital marketing, there was no digital anything, even though we may have used the word, but we didn't know what was going to happen. Marketing theory emerged in the early, yeah, before the 20th century. There wasn't even any marketing. Of course there was. People have been selling stuff since cavemen days. I'll swap you two spears for uh, rhinoceros hide. But of course, calling it marketing was the thing that happened. And I don't think Philip Kotler was around in the early 20th century, but the theory of marketing that we have today came to be in the mid 20th century and 1960s and 70s. The four Ps has become the dominant framework, was first published by Jerome McCarthy in 1960. So we kind of know where we are, all right? Shall I stop repeating what's happened and talk about the future? This was his book, by the way, Marketing and Managerial Approach and Product Price, Place and Promotion. Did you know that somebody had tried to add to it? The famous Booms and Bittner. If you've done some sort of qualification, I recommend the IBM ones. Uh, you will have studied that as well. The seven Ps, but why stop at seven? You know, 10 would be a much nicer number, wouldn't it? I'm sure between us, with our brain power, we could think of another three Ps. Decimal, you know, it's kind of more aesthetically pleasing. Berry's 10 Ps. Sounds like a book. <clears throat> Marketers know the customer. Okay, we know the customer. That's our job. No one should know the customer as well as marketers do. Okay, so let's just start with the product. Best marketers will have strong opinions on the product. Indeed, in financial services, the product may need help they need to be formulated and marketers can help. In my agency career, which I haven't told you my CV, but I worked in lots of agencies for a long time, worked on insurance, banking, loans, credit cards, investment products. And very often the product was kind of amorphous and you were part, even the agency was part of a process, let's formulate this, let's find something that we can sell. And when we finished it and it's absolutely right, then we think of giving it a name as opposed to when you arrive in your job as the new CMO and you're given a tube of toothpaste, please sell a million of those next year. Now, when the product is pretty fixed, and in many cases, the product is there, maybe you've got a range of products, marketing is tasked with creating demand in exchange for spending quite a lot of money, one hopes. Their ideas on making new products that the customer actually wants may not always be sought. And, you know, it's not really the scope of this evening to get into politics within organizations. And we love the other departments. But, you know, sometimes sales has its own agenda. IT has its own agenda. Does customer service report into marketing? Don't even open that can of worms. Think directly to the CEO. And finance benignly are overseeing everything to make sure we don't waste any money and we generate maximum ROI. Bless them. But they should be welcomed because marketers understand the customer. Okay, I heard the other day that Philip Kotler was known as the Dean. Never called him that, but it sounds like a good name. And it's what Americans call the boss of a business school. So let's see what the dean has to say. And he has been a big fan of the four Ps. And he talks about all four of them. Are you going to uh, are you going to do a webinar uh, and many other things? All of those are promotional channels. They're mean media channels, uh, and, and the P of promotion handles both uh, messaging and media. So, 
now, even packaging, people will say, oh, where's packaging? Because in the perfume world, the package is the whole thing. I mean, the, what's in the bottle is not as much cost as the bottle itself. And I say, well, packaging is part of the product. Um, in fact, services. They say, where's services? That begins with an S. Well, services, the product is sort of the offering. The offering is a mix of product and services um, and the way they're presented. So we think that they all collapse into the four P's. Now, there are some people who have talked about the four A's, the four C's, uh, and it doesn't have to be four. It could be 12. In fact, originally, the marketing mix was a word first used by Neil Borden at Harvard, and he had 12 elements to the marketing mix. Well, you can see that it's not an easy theory when you have 12. It's easier to remind companies uh, when, when they are looking at a marketing plan or a brand plan. So what's the product, what's the price, what's the place it's going to be available, and what's the promotion we're going to use? It works. I, I have no, no interest in protecting it. If something better comes along, I'm very happy to use it. It's actually quite good that we can still rely on something in this day and age. <laughs> Those are the four Ps, that's good. Yeah, I don't think we need 12 Ps. What do you think? Okay, so that's what the Dean's saying about product. And yeah, there's an interesting point that in certain categories, the packaging is pretty much part of the product. They say in alcohol, you're drinking the advertising, which is quite a nice idea, maybe quite worrying idea, but you are consuming everything you think about the brand. And you know, if you're wearing Levi's jeans, you're thinking of the logo, you're thinking of the ads, you're thinking about how you look, and you're also thinking to some extent about the functionality. The product may be fixed. In many others, there is flexibility. The packaging, bundling, presentation, delivery. If the product can be changed, companies should ask marketing. Before you do research and development or new product development, ask marketing. And here is the Dean, as we're gonna call him now, with one of his great quotes. Marketing is not the art of finding clever ways to dispose of what you make. Marketing is the art of creating genuine customer value. It's the art of helping your customer become better off. The marketer's watchwords are quality, service, and value. Of course, the last one is the big one, isn't it? Value. It's worth it. What's in it for me? Well, actually, they can answer that because we've told them and the product delivers and everyone is happy. And, you know, that is the essence of what we do. And remember, we know the customer. Okay, so let's move on to talk a little about price. Price is something that marketers don't, or don't often get involved in. And I once had an opportunity to teach a course on pricing strategy at a business school. I must have been, I had to learn a bit about it. And, you know, when I was a director in an agency, I better not say which one, my boss's idea of pricing strategy was, Mike, charge as much as you can get away with. Shocking. Okay, uh, so that's a short course, isn't it? That takes about 10 seconds to say, and yet this was 15 weeks, four hours a week. Of course, pricing is much, much, much more than that. And, you know, being senior in, in agencies, I did learn a lot about pricing beyond that. For instance, you mustn't lose money. So you've got to be ruthlessly on top of every cost, and you've got to make sure that every cost is billed to someone or covered. In other words, that your costs are not out of control. But equally, pricing can be tactical as well as strategic, because stuff can happen your biggest competitor drops their price on something very similar to what you're selling. Okay, how do we respond? Do we even have a strategy or is it completely ad hoc? I was once doing an IDM session I was training and the guy said, I think I can say what business he was in, our strategy is to be the cheapest. So that's easy, isn't it? All they had to do is check the competitor's prices every day and make sure they were undercutting them. Cross-channel ferry company, no longer with us. I'm not sure that there's a direct correlation there. But of course, the danger with that sort of pricing strategy is a race to the bottom. Price war can very often mean there are no winners. It's a pyrrhic victory. And the people who are making money, um, if they start giving it away, everyone starts losing money. And in that case, the one with the deepest pockets might be the last man standing. But it's maybe not healthy for anyone. So the essence of, of looking at pricing, and of course we're talking as marketers here, is some of our customers won't buy from us because they believe that our prices are too high. <laughs> well, duh, isn't that so much, such, so obvious? 
The trouble is we don't necessarily know this, but we have a pretty good reason to suspect it. So there are a lot of people out there who are not our customers who in many ways should be, but they think we're too expensive. So if you do market research with them, they will tell you, yeah, we think it's the best, but I can't afford it. Okay, I wonder how much they could afford. You know, so we're getting into price elasticity arguments here. Others are delighted with your product service and will willingly pay more. Damn, we didn't know that. We should have charged them a bit more. Especially in B2B. If you work in business to business, if, particularly if you work in sales, there's always a point at which you talk money. You know, how often have you heard this as the vendor? We really like your offering. Or we think we'd like to work with your company. You, you can definitely help us. Unfortunately, it's a bit more than we wanted to pay. Your fee proposal was a bit out of our league, um, but we'd love to find a way forward. In other words, drop your price. I've also had various meetings with procurement, nice people. And the client's procurement department, the bigger the client, the more impressive the procurement people. And they always started off when I was having regular meetings with them saying, we're not looking to beat you down on price. We're just looking for value. <clears throat> okay, well, we can't work any harder and we can't give you any better than we're giving you. So you actually want us to reduce our prices. Well, if you could see a way to cutting your fees, that would probably uh, help us overall to find better value. Yeah, okay, thought so. So others are delighted with your product and will willingly pay more. The need for pricing strategy. I will boldly say this should not be left to finance and not left to sales. But I would also say that pricing needs to involve the CFO and the CEO. Nothing could be more important. Every company has to think about a price for every single thing they sell. Okay, not even every product is advertised, but every product is priced. Or do you just leave it to junior people or the sales guys? Okay, you decide how much to charge for this. You know what the customers will pay. Well, sales may have an agenda, which may be volume, depending on how they're remunerated. Just saying. With our access, that's marketers, to market research data, insights derived from analytics, increasingly in the digital age, marketers increasingly understand the benefits that customers derive from our product features. We should have a good idea what customers will pay for. Maybe not perfect, but if anyone understands the customer enough to know their price elasticity and their willingness to pay, which are key concepts, it should be marketing. We should have a good idea exactly what customers will pay for and how much. Kotler rightly preaches about creating and capturing value. He says that's what businesses should be doing, corporate purpose. Okay, not-for-profits are a bit different. They're trying to do good works, but they're still marketing to get funds, to get donations. And as marketers, we need to be the champions of value-based pricing. So when I did teach this marketing pricing strategy course, I came out in favor of this thing called value-based pricing, which is fairly well established in the pricing world. In other words, you charge according to the value you're giving the customer. And ultimately, if the customer says, well, I can't pay that, I won't pay it, you have the opportunity to walk away. But by charging everyone the same, particularly in B2B, you may be leaving money on the table, and that's the opportunity missed. So value-based pricing tries to be flexible depending on the customer. And of course, we need to share our understanding and recommendations, even if sometimes people don't want to talk about price with the marketing department. You just make it look nice. We'll worry about the price, say the finance people. Okay, uh, we're running short on time because I've done too many ad libs. So I'll just leave you to think about these issues rather than have a discussion. Think of the best deal you ever got. When did you spend big but not regret it? It's like one of those articles in Metro, isn't it? Interview, worst thing you ever bought, best thing you ever bought. I think we can all think of these examples. When did you feel really ripped off? Ouch. Do you enjoy researching online and saving money? For some people, that's a hobby. And which have built a business on it and money saving expert. Uh, negotiating a good deal face to face. Maybe all of these, maybe both of those. But of course, pricing is very emotional and emotive. I had a great quote from Rory Sutherland the other day which may have been original, he said in B2C marketing, consumers are trying to avoid disappointment, i.e. regret. And in B2B marketing, buyers are trying to avoid being blamed. <laughs> in other words, post-purchase uh, reconsideration and regret. So we've got to understand that when we understand the buyer. Okay, a few bits of revision 
GCSE economics, anybody? The demand curve. I nearly said O-level there, but that would reveal that I might be over 30. Oops. <clears throat> the demand curve is the graph depicting the relationship between the price of a certain commodity and the amount of it that consumers are willing and able to purchase at that given price. Okay? The demand curve for all consumers together follows the demand curve of every individual consumer and the individual demands at each price are added together. Okay, so as the price goes up, demand goes down. I should say it was elementary economics. Okay? We're not going to do the complicated demand curves. When the cost changes, the demand will change. Uh, so when price goes up, demand goes down and the opposite. Demand curves plot the relationship between price and demand. You can see it here. The horizontal axis is the unit price and the vertical axis is the amount of that commodity. So we see that as you raise the price on the whole, consumption drops, demand drops. However, the slope might vary. Now it's going to get a bit interesting. The slope of the demand curve describes the relationship between price and demand or consumption. If it's gentle, large price increases don't make much difference. But if the slope, slope is steep, small changes cause big changes in consumption. Okay, so here's another one. Here's an example, selling biscuits or cookies. And basically, this is a nice business to be in. If you increase the price, you keep selling the same amount. My advice, increase the price. Okay, unusual and or probably unheard of situation. However, people normally use less of a commodity when the cost goes up, the price goes up. Since the line of the demand curve almost drops, you nearly always have a negative value. The slopes vary, and if the price goes up and people just pay the extra money and consume as much as they ever did, it would be a zero slope. But if they pay more when the price increases, but their consumption goes down, okay, so they're really suffering here. They're actually buying less, but they're still paying more. So demand in this case is inelastic, and it applies to necessities like food and shelter. So consumption may only drop slightly when the price increases. Okay, you see example there. But if the price of a commodity goes up and people consume less to the point they're not spending as much money as they did before, then you might say that's a pretty bad price increase. <laughs> you're actually killing your demand and you actually have less total revenue than you had before. The demand is elastic. We see elastic demand for luxury items like vacations and jewelry, which people think they can do without. And this is uh, an established model in pricing strategy by a guy called Nagel. You start with market value creation, then price structure, value communication, and that's where marketing comes into its own. You could say that all marketing is about, well, certainly all advertising is about convincing people of value. This is the price. This is what this product can do for you. Here are the benefits. Look, buy it. Then you get into pricing policy and price level setting. As an example, this is the introduction of iPad. Anyone remember? I remember actually uh, listening to it live. Do you know how long ago it is? Seven years. 2010. About nearly eight. And the great Steve Jobs, who was, if nothing else, a great presenter, but I think he was a lot more than that, had the fun of presenting it and also telling us what we should pay. And one of the interesting things about this presentation was that there was no reference point because we didn't have anything quite like it. He said the famous words when he unle we thought it would be called the iTab or the iSlate or something. Do you remember all that? A lot of speculation. And of course, Apple had fueled the speculation. Uh, but he said it's like holding the internet in your hand. Great line. I wonder if he wrote it. But of course, we didn't really have much familiarity with touch screens then. So, you know, we knew what an iPhone was like and you could touch it with your finger and it wasn't that great, but it was you know, it was sensational that you didn't need a, a keyboard like on a BlackBerry. But this was like a giant iPhone, and therefore there was nothing quite like it to compare it with. Very hard to know what you should pay for it. An amazing product, tremendous breath. What should we price it at? Well, if you listen to the pundits, we're going to price it under $1,000, which is code for $9.99. When we set out to develop the iPad, we not only had very ambitious technical goals, 
and user interface goals. But we had a very aggressive price goal because we want to put this in the hands of lots of people. Nice of you, Steve. Thank you. And just like we were able to meet or exceed our technical goals, we have met our cost goals. And I am thrilled to announce to you that the iPad pricing starts not at $9.99, but at $499. Oh. It's the only film I could find of that. Apple have taken away the original. But what was he doing, of course? Price anchoring. He was getting us to think $9.99 so that anything else would be a great deal. He actually went on, because I do remember it, to explain all the options. And actually, it's a pretty poor base model for $4.99. By the time you added on the extra gig and the Wi-Fi, fast Wi-Fi in those days, uh, you were about $950. And it all worked, out, you know, but he explained every little increment. And by that time, we were thinking $4.99, wow, what a wonderful deal, much cheaper than a horrible Windows laptop. So why am I showing you this? It's the psychology of pricing. And I think people that know the customer have a point of view on this because we do understand the customers. Here's an example from a, a behavioral economist, a guy called Dan Ariely. I love his stuff. And he's uh, written a few books. One of them is called... Um, the truth about dishonesty. In other words, how people make decisions between right and wrong, ethics, and he also takes it into the realm of pricing. And here's a great example. He describes a famous example in his amazing book, Predictably Irrational. He came across the following description, following offer from The Economist, okay? And this was the offer, and it was an online application form. Pick the type of subscription you want to buy or renew. Economist subscription, $59. One-year subscription to The Economist includes online access to all articles since 1997. Okay, that's the online-only version. Option B, print subscription, $125. US One-year subscription to the print edition of The Economist. Only the print. Okay, which one do you want so far? Third one, print and web subscription, again $125. One year subscription to the print edition of The Economist and online access to all articles in The Economist in 1997. Which would you choose? Maybe like the print edition as well, though. So maybe you'd choose that one, and some people would just choose that one. No one in their right mind would choose that one. But maybe that's serving a purpose. So in an experiment, Ariely removed it and gave it to 100 MIT students. And he compared what the results were with the bit in the middle and without. Most people now chose the first option. So the middle option wasn't useless, but rather helped people make a choice. People have trouble comparing different options, but if two of them are similar and one of them is plainly crazy, that helps them. So we're into the psychology of how people make purchase decisions. This is Ariel explaining it a bit better than I did. <laughs> Here are two examples of this principle. This was an ad from The Economist a few years ago that gave us three choices. An online subscription for $59, a print subscription for $125, or you can get both for $125. Now, I looked at this and I called up The Economist and I tried to figure out what were they thinking. And they passed me from one person to another to another. Uh, until eventually I, I got to the to a person who was in charge of the website and I, I called them up and they went to check what was going on and the next thing I know the ad is gone and uh, no explanation. So I, so I decided to do the experiment that I, do, I would have loved the economist to do with me. I took this and I gave it to 100 MIT students. I said, what would you choose? I need on the market share. Most people wanted the combo deal. Thankfully, nobody wanted the dominated option. That means our students can read. <laughs> but now, if you have an option that nobody wants, you take it off, right? So I, took, I printed another version of this, and I eliminated the middle option, and I gave it to another 100 students. Here's what happens. 
Uh, now the most popular option became the least popular and the least popular became the most popular. So what's going on, the bit in the middle is helping them decide. Now we don't know actually what the economists would prefer, and that's another matter. But it's interesting that an option no one chooses does influence what they do choose. What was happening is that the option that was useless in the middle was useless in the sense that nobody wanted it. But it wasn't useless in the sense that it helped people figure out what they wanted. In fact, relative to the option in the middle, which was um, get, get only the print for 125, the print anywhere for 125 looked like a fantastic deal. And as a consequence, people chose it. The general idea here, by the way, is that we actually don't know our preferences that well. And because we don't know our preferences that well, we're susceptible to all of these influences from the external forces. The defaults, the particular options that are presented to us, and so on. Okay, so I won't spend any more time on that. But if you're interested, the man's name is Dan Ariely. And I think this whole area of behavior economics is fascinating. If you work in e-commerce, it's your job. So you're thinking of user experience, you're thinking about how you present prices, and how you anchor the customer's perception. It's like the wine list. So many people choose the second most expensive wine. No one chooses the most expensive wine unless they're really trying to show off. It's a bit bling, isn't it? And no one chooses the cheapest, but a lot of people choose the second cheapest, so as not to appear to be a cheapskate. And if you know that, then you can design your pricing accordingly. Marketers know the customer. Okay, place. Well, that's the most boring of all, and it's just about putting stuff in Stobart lorries and driving it to the north of England and it will get there. Leave it to the distribution department. But what if it is e-commerce? Do we not need place then? It's something of a fake P and that should be really D for distribution. Many products are ordered, some are even delivered online. And that's where we can say, well, in that case, the user experience is distribution. It's the third P. Place. Is the product available to the customer? seamlessly, conveniently, always in stock, downloads easily, installs on their device. In other words, that's a seamless process. So worrying about lorries and, and trucks and pallets is replaced by worrying about user experience. So no schedule of drivers or freight forwarding. Places ease of access. Can the product be downloaded and installed seamlessly and efficiently? Uh, not only user experience, but also customer experience. You've heard that one? CX is the latest acronym, along with CRO, conversion rate optimization. Again, marketers should have a big input into this. E-commerce is all about place. So don't leave that to other people, such as the IT department who own the website. If you're in marketing and you're selling by e-commerce, you should be all over that. What is it? What is UX and CX? It's the best experience every time. And with e-commerce, your site is your shop. And I found these. How wonderful. This is Microsoft's website in 1994. It looked like a CD-ROM with a byte out of it. Remember CD-ROMs? Certainly couldn't eat them. How about this? The Guardian's website. This was actually their customer website, their consumer-facing site. Looks like a sitemap. Okay, well, the sitemap would have been very easy to do because it was exactly that. And here's Apple's website with a logo part of an ad for BMW, which is bigger than the Apple logo. I may not be an expert on online display, but I don't think the ads should be bigger than the masthead of your own brand. But that was 1994, long time ago. And what a great picture. This is <laughs> people looking at a website, none of your websites I know, but I don't think they liked it, <clears throat> and it's not good. So we don't want to give users a bad experience. This is a book by Steve Krug, and if you don't have time to read it, just remember the title, because it kind of says it all. Don't make me think. It's about usability. People don't like thinking. Have you noticed? It's work. It's effort. As my daughters say, who are in their early 20s, it's an ag. We don't want to give our customers an ag, certainly. And also, we all have our limits beyond which we say, give this, you know, what's the expression? Blow this for a game of soldiers. I'm going back to Instagram. This is just boring. Let me disconnect from this experience. I have been in trouble for this slide, but I'm unrepenting. Another behavior economist, Mark Earls, said, thinking is to humans as swimming is to cats. I'm not suggesting that you would throw a cat into the Thames. But if you did for any reason, shame on you, but the cat might survive because cats apparently can swim. Would they be happy? Do they like having a bath? If you have a cat, the answer is no. And humans don't like having to think either. 
they might be able to do it, whatever you ask them to do online on your website, but they're going to hate you. A good example of that is the HMRC tax return, which is coming up for all self-employed people. Yay, great pleasure. Thanks so much for our Sunday afternoons. But they do now give you a LinkedIn progress bar, which says, don't worry, you're 80% done. Keep going. Eventually, you'll be allowed to have a glass of wine, and it might not even be as late as 8 o'clock if you can get it done. So they're kind of encouraging you. And that's user experience design, and they're getting a bit better at doing it. Of course, they have a fantastic advantage over other marketing decision makers because if you don't engage with their website, they send you to jail. Whereas <laughs> with your website, you don't have that sanction, I'm imagining, depending on where you work. We're all busy, we're all impatient, we're becoming increasingly demanding, don't push it. I think this guy is just about to press the back button. He's had it, okay? So this uh, engagement is fragile. And Google once said, disloyalty is only one click away, which is a nice quote, isn't it? How about this? Who invented this idea? Control, alt, delete. There's a danger we accept it because it's just something you do with computers, isn't it? You learn it. And when all else fails, when you're not quite ready to switch the computer off, you try control alt delete hard, a hard reset. We will learn to do this stuff if we must, but why? Why ask customers to do something difficult? Certainly don't ask them to remember anything. That's real effort. And with this in mind, I invented this mnemonic. And it's not Sostak, unfortunately, or Pastel, but it's great. Make your website great. Get users to the content they want fast. Reward their effort and time. Engage them or you'll lose them. Add value throughout the customer journey. Think about users first, then your objectives. And if I'm feeling particularly nasty to my students, I teach them this and say, this might come up in your assignment, and they have to use it. <clears throat> the marketers of the future, one class at a time. And this, of course, is from Mark Atunis, from Tom Fishburne, uh, who does a lot of good stuff. Some of it you think, well, yeah, but one or two of them are classics. I read that the average Consumer has a lower attention span than a goldfish. Sorry, did you say something? Engage them or lose them. So with usability and user experience, use a mix of experience, judgment, and testing. And the older I get, the more I like experience. Looking at young people in the audience. Because, uh, you know, that's the trade-off, isn't it? You haven't got quite so much energy and enthusiasm as maybe when you were 22, 23, but you've seen a lot of it. And rather than being a Jeremiah and saying, well, we tried that and it didn't work, oh, no, no, boring. Uh, we say, well, okay, well, this might work based on things you've seen work and stuff you know from other places. And judgment, and don't uh, diss judgment either. And of course, testing. We are at the IDM. So we have to mention testing at least once in every presentation. Don't be creative in web design. That's a, a serious point. Uh, we don't want to intrigue people or puzzle them and say, oh, I wonder how we should get to that. Where's the checkout? Maybe I'll click here and see what happens. You know, I do teach in a few places and the online learning system is like a voyage of discovery. You click somewhere, oh, that's happened. It's not good usability. We want things to be intuitive and predictable. You can spend your effort and creativity on beautiful photography and lovely experiences and things that flow, but don't trick them. Don't try and puzzle them. Remember the brand? Is it on strategy? Testing is easy, but we plan and control it. Design our site for the user, the rest will follow. So this is really the third P. This is place. This is getting people to the content they want. And we're always trying to learn, and marketers know the customer. And lastly, the one that we definitely own. No one tries to take this off us, do they? The ultimate aim is marketing communications, of course, to acquire customers and sell products to them. Basics, huh? That promotion is the domain of marketing is unchallenged. For every campaign, marketing creates a communications plan in which every step of the acquisition sales process is addressed across all media channels, offline and online. And of course, our strategy is derived from the broader business strategy. Everything is good. Marketing needs to be at the forefront of overall strategy setting so that the customer's wants and needs are at the heart of it. And a friend of mine who's a CMO, she said, I go to the board meeting and they know that at some point I'm going to say, what about the customer? With boring predictability, because that's her job, and she doesn't apologize for it. She is the one who always sticks up for the customer. Who else is going to? You know, Sales are going to try and stitch the customer up with more sales. Finance is trying to make more money out of them and cut costs in terms of what we give them. And marketing says, well, hang on. We've got to think about the customer, because we're not giving them value. And 
some of the customers who bought something from us will be disappointed. Yeah, and this is Sostack, which we teach at the IDM. And, you know, someone said to me, it's not very clever, is it? It's clever because it's simple. And, the, you know, P.R. Smith, who's a, a great guy, said, uh, make sure, Mike, in your training, you always make sure that you put the registered trademark there because it's the registered trademark of P.R. Smith, who is not Paul Smith, the famous fashion designer. Uh, but for SEO reasons, he decided that he'd better be P.R. because it's easier to optimize for that. Situation analysis, objective, strategy, tactics, actions, and control, just like the four Ps. If you think about it, though, this applies to the fourth P. He's not really saying take control of the product or the price or the place. So it could be the SOSPAC marketing communications planning network, planning framework. Okay, so this is the fourth P. And of course, digital is making a massive difference. This is from eMarketer. All the numbers are going up. The black one is total digital ad spending. And the red one is showing how it's changing. Okay, well, there comes a time when it's growing at a constant rate. Okay, but it's still growing. So that red line is showing that it's uh, constantly increasing. And percentage of total media ad spending is also increasing. But we still have TV, and we still have print, and we still have radio and direct mail. And those who predicted in the year 2000 that digital was going to kill offline were wrong. You know, it's possible to get a bit carried away with some of these predictions. Digital in 2018, 2019, these are all changes. Okay, so the pace of change of digital is declining. Something interesting, you wouldn't hear a lot of digital people admit. TV is doing fine. And if anything, TV and, and digital are converging. What is not in any way declining is video. And remember, video used to be TV and cinema. Now it's everywhere. So print is declining for sure, and, t and video is growing. The question is, where is that video going to be consumed? Direct mail, in terms of spend, is declining. But I think, actually, direct mail is still very effective if it goes to the right people. So the direct mail guys are spending a lot more money on targeting and on database and profiling and insights and less money on trees and print. And unless you happen to run a printing business, people probably won't shed any tears for that. And you can see the others here. This is from eMarketer again. And in fact, you know, the, the overall marketing spend is going up. And of course, digital is growing and mobile is growing. This is from Smart Insights, Dave Chaffee and his empire. SEO, these are the positively rated digital channels. And you can see that the dark one is the highest rated. And SEO, content marketing, email marketing, you know, it's hard to find a more unfashionable channel than email. But look, CMOs are saying, yeah, it works especially in B2B, especially for retention. Paid search, social media, website personalization, online PR, and display advertising. I think that's an interesting one, isn't it? We don't have time tonight. But the combination of ad blockers and doubts about metrics, and Mark Pritchard from P&G regularly stands up and says, I don't believe any of the numbers I'm being told, and I'm not exactly saying my agency is ripping me off, but I'd like to see better metrics. And the fact that some people just say, I don't want to see any ads. This is a big threat to publishers. So big question mark over online display. And those like PNG who are doing it are doing more and more programmatic. And why do you need an agency for that? You do the programmatic in-house. And I was speaking to someone today who said it's happening really, really fast. So the media agencies are losing half their job, which is the buying. Their future may be planning consultants, media planning. And this is Smart Insights. Again, they ask this question every year. Does the organization have a clearly defined digital marketing strategy? Yes, very confident. It's integrated into our marketing strategy. Yes, it's defined in a separate document, <laughs> which no one ever reads. And lastly, no, we are doing digital marketing, but no defined strategy. This raises lots of questions, doesn't it? Like you'd like to know what they really mean by that. So who took our P's? Sales, finance, IT, particularly this, the... Uh, the uh, IT director or the information director, or whatever the titles are, they certainly have a point of view on a lot of the things we've been discussing tonight. I'm not suggesting marketing grabs stuff and excludes our colleagues. I'm saying that we get into that conversation and play our part. The rest of the C-suite, marketing should have a point of view and a seat at the top table. If we don't have a point of view, we shouldn't be at the top table, but we know the customer. 
Right, last video I'm going to show you tonight. I'm um, sorry if you've seen it before. I saw it at first time at a conference. It's about bringing the love back. And the analogy is the breakup of a relationship. But bad marketing is a bit like this. Hey there. Long time no see. Looking good. Yeah. Let's just keep this simple. I want a divorce. What now? I think you heard me just fine. Come on. This is me. What's wrong? We don't talk anymore. I just put down the mail on the TV commercial just to talk to you. Exactly. You do all the talking. I never get a chance. Talk on our website, can't you? Sure. If I want to say, order this product. See? It's not exactly a dialogue. What about the print campaign, hmm? You can't tell me you missed the billboard in Times Square. It was like a 200 foot tall declaration of love. You're saying you love me, but you're not behaving like you love me. It's not genuine. I don't know. The agency said I was genuinely being funny. Genuinely being charming. They said you would love everything I did. Did you keep stop not doing a radio commercial? Look, whether you're funny or not, it's just I've changed and you haven't. I mean, we don't even hang out in the same places mm. anymore. You're not even listening, are you? Coupons. You want coupons, don't you? Look, come by the store, I got two words for you. Loyalty, redemption. Wow. Am I right? That was it, wasn't it? Let's just hug. If you knew me, you know I don't care about that. No, sweetheart, I know everything about you. You're 28 to 34. Your online interests include music, movies, and laser hair removal. You have a modest but dependable disposable income. Am I the only one not getting a problem with? I'm not here. Oh, come on. Don't be like that. Look, I tell you what, come back here tomorrow. I'll give you the chance to win a Bahamas vacation. <laughs> There's a small chance, minuscule, but technically still a chance. Why do you like the old days? From Microsoft. You see, Microsoft have a sense of humor. <clears throat> okay, summarize. Define your key successful outcomes, your KPIs, craft a plan, review, test and refine, maximize ROI and fit digital and online and offline together. David Ogilvy once said it takes a big idea to attract the attention of consumers and get them to buy your product. Unless your advertising contains a big idea, it will pass like a ship in the night. Isn't it nice? I doubt if more than one campaign in a hundred contains a big idea. Well, okay, but sometimes you just want a quick banner or a fast piece of direct mail. Let's not try and uh, you know, win a can award every single time. But once in a while, there's an opportunity to do something a bit different. This is from a much newer successful ad man, Charles Valance from BCCP. The smaller media becomes, the bigger our creative ideas need to be. The fragmented media tail can wag the big idea dog. We end up with disparate executions as opposed to one big and beautifully integrated campaign. If you start with a small thought designed for a specific medium, you'll always struggle to make it big. But if you start with a big thought designed for no media in particular, it will integrate effortlessly across the piece. Those, these higher order ideas are the gold dust of our trade. Gerd Leonard, the futurist, says the future may be permanent beta, meaning it never settles. We keep on changing. And this is so, a guy whose stuff I really like, Mark Ritson. A bit provocative, a bit controversial in Marketing Week. Marketing has been changed by digital. At a tactical level, our discipline is barely recognizable as the one that started the new century. But on the strategic plane, it's very much business as usual. We've got fabulous new marketing tools to play with, but the age-old questions of marketing, insight, creativity, positioning, engagement, and effect, they remain as annoyingly elusive as ever. Isn't that great? And when he says effect, he's talking about analytics. You know, we couldn't measure TV, we still can't really measure TV, but Coca-Cola and Starbucks and now Google and Facebook spend a load of money on above-the-line advertising. We also can't measure social media very well, but we have a lot of followers on Twitter and we have a lot of likes. What's the value of them? Uh, we don't quite know yet. So modern marketers deserve a seat at the top table. Every business should be built around customers and we are the customer experts. But to justify membership of the C-suite, We've got to remember McCarthy and add value to the operations across all four P's, not just one. So don't settle for a career as a single P marketer. That is the end. Okay, thank you very much. And if you look outside, there may be some wine left. Thank you. Thank you.